Hello, comrades. Welcome to our latest webinar in the series Abolition. We're very pleased tonight to have with us Camilla Power and Chris Knight, both radical anthropologists who are looking at the uh, system of the patriarchy. Um, I should say there's nothing natural about the patriarchal system of capitalism, despite the fact that we often hear natural or biological reasons for it. Men are stronger, faster, etc. Women have to give birth, they have to stay at home, look after the baby. It's a natural division of labor. But in fact, quite the opposite uh, is, is actually true. The reason we became human and made the leap from monkey-like creature, and it was a, an evolutionary leap, is down to what many anthropologists and scientists now call the human revolution. I've just talked and double checked with Camilla. It's about two hundred thousand years ago. The size, well, it's it's you know, it's not an actual leap from one year to the next, but it's a long period. But about two hundred thousand years ago, the size of the human brain suddenly massively increased in size, uh, allowing us to develop culture, language, etc., i.e., making us actually human. And both Camilla and Chris have developed a theory. Um, they believe that a coordinated sex strike or coordinated female solidarity, keeping men in check, was behind that human revolution. It's an absolutely thrilling and mind-blowing subject. When I first heard it, my mind was blown. And I'm very pleased you're both here to, to talk us through this. So we want to find out how did that happen? What happened to end it? And you know, how, what can we do perhaps to reestablish a really egalitarian system? So thank you both for joining. I think Camilla is going to start, isn't she? Andrew. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting us, Tina, because abolishing patriarchy is like one of the most important things that we can possibly think about. Um, patriarchy's really got us into this shit. And this week just showed us how and apart from the patriarchal warmongering um, in east of Europe over you know, territory, um, we, we've also had the IPCC report so, just showing that even now they hardly dare to mention that we, we've got to change our old attitude about degrowth, you know, growth, perpetual growth, which is the product of fundamentally patriarchal and capitalist ideas about always got to be better, always got to be bigger, always got to be competing and hierarchical. Um, and we just can't afford it anymore. If we are going to save our beautiful planet, um, we have to get rid of it. We've got to ditch it. But that's difficult, as you say. You know, how do we do abolition if it's going to be much, much harder if it's true that patriarchy is kind of natural and inevitable? So does everybody really think patriarchy is natural and always existed. Well, Friedrich Engels, for one, he did not. This he wrote in the late 19th century. One of the most absurd notions taken over from the 18th century enlightenment is that in the beginning of society, women, woman was the slave of man. Uh, so that comes from origin of the family, private property and estate. Um, and now not everything that he wrote in that book is totally correct, but there are many, many arguments he produced that can stand up to the test of time in terms of today's anthropology. Um, and this argument, of course, about a, a matriarchal stage or an early stage of women's sexual freedom and autonomy was something rooted in the old Backhofen theories, but especially Engels paid attention to Lewis Henry Morgan's understanding of the evolution of kinship um, and, and human societies. Um, and both Morgan and Engels Marx um, saw women's initial sexual freedom as something that declined, that, that, that was lost over time until eventually there was some hit world historic defeat of the female sex. Um, what about today in terms of liberal feminist uh, kind of guardian Easter feminist thinking, because that's where we really hear this, this idea that somehow women were always the slave of man. This, for instance, this is Caitlin Moran. Women have basically done fuck all for 100,000 years. 
Okay, so this is a, 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 a position coming. It's not well informed. You know, Caitlin Moran doesn't know much at all about hunter gatherers or evolution at all, but she's looking at a, you know, for a, a middle class career woman who's who's achieved things in a capitalist patriarchal world, um, even though that's a tiny percentage of the, the women on the planet today. Um, and they're looking back into the murky past and thinking with horror of those cavemen dragging women around by the hair. But they actually don't know anything about, uh, uh, about human evolution or the emergence of human society. And anybody with some anthropological understanding of that is just going to say, you know, no way. You look at across continents, indigenous women's capacities of organization, their solidarity, their strategies of resisting exploitation. And um, whenever white people, white men, Western colonial officials and Western missionaries came into those indigenous cultures to exploit and extract and to, to you know, take, take over the territories, they had to meet not just a resistance from men, but most of all, a most persistent resistance from women, which they just, you know, they really couldn't conceive. How was that possible? Because in their world, gendered hierarchies were so kind of ossified that, that men were always the ones who were active, women were passive and stayed in the home, and none of that fit, none of that fit to indigenous women's cultures. Um, and indigenous, particularly in colonial regimes, indigenous women's movements were often central to dismantling those regimes, often to the complete and utter bafflement of the, the, the white Western colonial officials. And of course, the missionaries whose job was to impose a gender hierarchy that came out of the West. But I'm going to focus today with Chris's help on um, hunter gatherer cultures not because hunter-gatherers are some kind of halfway missing link. We just get rid of this idea. Hunter-gatherer people are every bit as civilized, every bit as sophisticated in the 21st century. In fact, many aspects of their egalitarian cultures really are the most cognitively demanding in terms of social and emotional intelligence to navigate. These are societies organizing themselves with no police, no judges, no prisons, they organize themselves to cooperate when there's no force of coercion. And this is, this is like the secret, the incredible secret of their success, um, because those cultures have come with us, that, that sort of a culture, that sort of ancestral culture has come right down into the present day with Africa, certain African hunter-gatherers. And they can teach us um, about what would gender relations have looked like in the ancestral past. Um, and so I've, I've had the, the luck and privilege to be able to learn from um, egalitarian hunter-gatherers, uh, indeed the Hadza, so we'll, we'll talk some about that. We're gonna focus on Africa because Africa is the home of our species. And the main message, ditch caveman theory. We, we became human in a social sexual revolution. Uh, the epicenter was Africa. We've been modern humans in Africa two or three times as long before any modern humans moved out of Africa to become the ancestors of, of those peoples today who are not of recent African descent. Um, and this is our Paleolithic birthright. This um, egalitarianism, this non-patriarchy um, is our Paleolithic birthright, that, that, that equality, but Patriarchy is trying to keep it a deathly secret through all its institutions, including scientific institutions that put its tentacles in there, you know, to, to kind of maintain the status quo. So it isn't something that, that is easy to talk about. It, it isn't something that, that passes the censorship of capitalist patriarchy. So let's start by just asking the basic question, um, is male dominance, actually just natural um, before I'm going to ask Chris to answer this question but but just worth reflecting on you know the intellectual dark web where there are all kinds of idiots posing as evolutionary experts people like Jordan Peterson who, who 
uh, with his do lobsters proving male dominance in vertebrates. Well, Chris, can you tell us uh, about the situation in great apes who are vastly more close relatives to us than lobsters? Well, um, I've got this book here, um, Demonic Males, um, by Richard Wrangham, who is probably the most well-known um, traumatologist, uh, particularly when it, when it comes to chimpanzees. And uh, this is um, Apes and the Origins of Human Violence, um, an excellent study of the origins of human violence, a, a bestseller. And uh, at first sight, the argument seems, yeah, you, you can understand the, the force of it because um, chimpanzees, there's no question about it, we are very closely related genetically to chimpanzees, um, as Darwin was the first to fully realize. And there's not much question about chimpanzee politics. They are not uh, anarchists. They are not libertarian communists, these chimpanzees. They're extremely, I mean, I shouldn't generalize too much, but the chimpanzees that we know most about, so Jane Goodall um, was a very, obviously very, very well known pioneer field worker among chimpanzees in a place towards the east of the, of the range of, of chimpanzees in, in Central Africa. And in fact, Rangham was her uh, student. In that area, um, Gombe Stream in, 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 in Tanzania, um, every single male, is dominant over every single female. So what happens is as the, as the male chimpanzees come of age, they kind of prove themselves by beating up every female. And even a, even a relatively small or weak male ends up um, being dominant over even quite, quite strong females. And um, there's a good deal of rape goes on. Um, males patrol their territories. There's, there's what the primatologists call warfare, you know, because um, males put the, the males chimpanzees patrol their territories, and if they and if they find a lone enemy, they'll pound it, pound that to death. Um, and it's uh, yes, I mean these are our close genetic relatives. However, <laughs> equally closely related to us are chimpanzees who used to be called pygmy chimps um, and are now generally called by their local name bonobos. And bonobos are just as closely related genetically as to us as what are called common chimps. And uh, guess what? First of all, we hardly know about them. They haven't featured in all these, um, these scenarios, hardly at all. That's partly because they were, field work was quite difficult because um, in the areas where they um, live, um, there was a, a long-term um, civil war. It was very difficult to do the field work, and it was done by Japanese primatologists mainly in the, in the 70s and 80s. But secondly, um, the message coming out from the bonobos, it's just the wrong message. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not what, <laughs> it's, not, it's not what the establishment wants to hear. Because although chimpanzee, although bonobo chimpanzee, I have, I'm calling them chimpanzees because that's what they are, but they're called, you know, they're, although they're, the females are slightly smaller actually, um, than the males, bonobo society is essentially matriarchal. And the only reason it's matriarchal is because the females form very strong coalitions with each other. And in fact, they form lesbian bonds with each other. Now, why is it, why is it that such closely related um, great apes, chimpanzees, can be so different in politics, one extremely male dominated and the other essentially matriarchal? Well, what seems to have happened is um, that around, um, around a million years ago, the Congo River dried up. It actually dried up about two million years ago. They can tell this from sediments and the area where the, where the, where the Congo spills into the Atlantic. And, the, and geologists have worked out that it, it pretty much dried up two million years ago and then dried up again one million years ago. Now, common chimpanzees are hydrophobic. They don't like water. And there's no way normally those chimpanzees could have crossed the Congo to the, from the north side where, the, where they live um, to the south. But when it dried up, it looks as if a small, a small number of chimpanzees made it south of the river. And what they found on the other side of the river was a kind of paradise, because whereas the common chimpanzees in the area where Jane Goodall was working, um, it's quite Quite, there's quite a lot of scarcity. It's not a resource-rich area, and the females in particular. I'm going. I'm talking about common chimps now, north of the Congo. 
in 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 in, in um, Gombe, the chimpanzees compete. The females compete with each other for their feeding patch, and a female who's invaded by a a, a, a neighbor, a young female may come into an area that the, the resident female will, will beat her up, perhaps kill her baby. It's extremely competitive. And that's because of resource shortages, scarcity. Now, when these chimpanzees a million years ago crossed the river to the south side and found themselves in a very resource rich area, wetlands, marshlands, wooded areas, grasslands, but, but really quite a, a mosaic, extremely. Um, rich in, 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 in food, in, including aquatic foods and shellfish, as well as, as well as lily bulbs and so on. What it meant was that the females could afford to forage together. And what they did is they foraged together, formed alliances, and, and what eventually happened was that they, had, they, they, they were so closely bonded to each other that any, any male who tried to, I mean, supposing that the females caught a, a small antelope, which they sometimes do, um, and, and the, the male may, may have tried to steal that food. That's certainly what they would do among the common chimpanzees. If, if, the, if, the, if when a, a colobus monkey is, is caught, the females don't get a look in. The, the males fight over it. They start eating it while it's still alive, tearing it, tearing it to, uh, apart. But south of the Congo, when the females feel a little bit threatened by a male, what they do is they just they do, do a bit of gigi rubbing. They bond with each other. They have this kind of almost like a motto: if it, if it moves, have sex with it. So they they they, you know, they use sex to, to form their alliances, and they're not related to each other. I can go into why they wouldn't be. It's because they, they move out on from their immediate locality when they come of age, and um, and they and they become dominant. I'll just end by simply saying that on the question of warfare, it's so interesting. The common chimps, um, as I was saying, the males patrol their boundaries. And, and, and will beat up any isolated enemy male or female, actually, that, that they find. Very often female, although they may rape her or maybe kill her baby. But south of the, of the Congo, where the, where the bonobos evolved, uh, uh, began evolving about a million years ago, what happens is it's quite extraordinary. When, when a group of um, bonobos get to the edge of their territory, the males get a little bit worried because they sort of feel they're losing control. What, what's going to happen to the females? Who are they going to be having sex with? And they start trying to exercise a little bit of kind of patriarchal control. But what happens is that the females gang up with the enemy females, forming an alliance with them against their own males in order to have sex, first of all, with the enemy females. I'm, saying, I'm using enemy, of course, in the sense of the, the out group, in order then to start having sex with the enemy males. I mean, this is, this is like warfare in reverse. Uh, it's the opposite of warfare. And, listen, and, listen, and I should just say that there's no... No one's ever recorded any instance of rape among the bonobos. There's never been any instance of infanticide among the bonobos. All the, all the horrors which people like Rangham say are natural to us because, because we are closely related to them, hang on a bit, but equally closely related to the bonobos. And all those dynamics, those political dynamics are in reverse among these equally closely related great ape um, relatives of ours. <laughs> So I don't know. So, so I, has that answered the question? I mean, it's just, it's uh, nobody say. I should I should really stress. Nobody's saying that we we humans were like either common chimpanzees or bonobos. The, the, the last common ancestor when of, of of both us and and both types of chimpanzees would have been about six million years ago, mm -hmm. and we we don't really have much clue what they were like. They were, they were probably something quite different from any of those three. Either either different from from humans, of course. The difference from common chimps as as from pig from pygmies, but there's absolutely no reason to suppose that uh, you know that pa that patriarchy male dominance is natural, given that that if you like matriarchy is is equally possible to, to dependent on on economic conditions, subsistence conditions. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Chris. That that is just showing the range of possibilities <coughs> amongst our great ape ancestors. So let's try and turn to the evolution of, of Homo, genus Homo, our own genus. I'm going to go back about two million years here, and I'm going to try and share screen because I think it might help to have a few images if I can pick up the images. Um, is that showing? Yes, all good. Can we show it? And I'll just get it full screen for you. Okay. Um, so. 
recently, so some of you may have heard of the kind of idea of man the hunter, so that the whole focus of human evolution has been, oh, it was men doing it because men were doing the hunting and they were looking after their wife and kiddies. And so it was all about, all, about man, man the hunter. But recently, and this century especially, there's been a whole feminist turn in understanding of human evolution and the so-called grandmother hypothesis. And we're looking at a, a, a lovely, um, uh, had a grandmother here that I, I knew when I was working in the field, Lumi, with all her grandchildren from the camp. And they are her daughter's children. So this is a really important thing. The, the mother is living with her daughter. The son-in-law is in the camp. And really, Lumbi, as the mother-in-law of that hunter, she is the boss. You know, that hunter has to respect her and to um, <laughs> just mind his P's and Q's, because if he, if he offends her and disrespects her in any way, you know, he's, he's out on his ear. He's not going to be able to, he has no conjugal rights <laughs> in the daughter, the mum of, of these, these kids here. Um, grandmother hypothesis is a story about the origins of our life history and the menopause um, and the idea that um, women got help, especially from their mothers in raising increasingly large brained um, children. Um, so, and this is thought to go back as many as uh, one and a half, two million years into Homo erectus. Now, the other book on the other side, Mothers and Others, closely related to this idea, um, the author, Sarah Blafahadi. Um, this is a beautiful book. It's one of the best books to read if you are interested in human evolution, Mothers and Others. Um, it focuses especially on cooperative childcare. That what is special, what really differentiates us from the other great apes, the chimps, the bonobos, gorillas and orangutans that, um, that Chris has just been talking about, we do babysitting. We babysit. In other words, we look after each other's children. But um, chimps and bonobos, mums, they do all the work entirely by themselves. The reason for that, Chris mentioned it, that they're actually, females are not living with their mums. They're not living with their sisters. So in this camp where Luumbi was with her daughter, there would have been other sisters or closely related women who would, I mean, just, it, it would be entirely natural for them to look after each other's children. They don't distinguish in a Hadza camp in today everybody looks after everybody else's children. There's just no, no. And, but from the moment of a child being born, um, they will be that day passed around into the hands of several, a dozen other people, both women and men who would hold and, and get to know that child. This is impossible to imagine for great apes, for chimps or bonobos, it just does not happen. The mother hangs onto her child for dear life because she just doesn't trust somebody else. So what that's saying is that in our evolution, and this is for sure for about two million or one and a half million years, mothers were living with others they could trust, which meant fundamentally their female relatives, others they could trust with taking care, helping to take care of their babies. Now, um, Sarah's argument about, about this babysitting is that as soon as a mother gives the baby into the hands of somebody else, this sets up a whole new dynamic of the ways that mom looks at baby, baby looks at the new carer who's looking after them, the carer's checking that maybe her, her, her mother to the, to the mom, and this is the cause, the, the beginning, the evolution of what, um, well, of, of mutual mind reading, of reading and understanding each other's emotional states, which is something that we humans do in a way that no other great ape does at all. Great apes' eyes are like 
they're round and dark. They're like sunglasses. Great apes want to know what an other ape is thinking, but they don't want to let the other ape know what they are thinking or feeling. It's because it's too competitive. But in our, in the emergence of genus homo and these societies with grandmother care, um, with mutual child care, we also began to develop mutual mind reading. So these had core female coalitions looking after children together and beginning to bring males as well into that childcare in a way that no other great apes did before. Now, the thing that really drives uh, the evolution and the thing that was so critical for us, this is a bit of a sciencey chart and I just wanna keep it really simple, um, but it's showing the, the material story of human evolution and why it has to be female strategies that are the most critical. This is showing the size of brains and every, every um, mark on this chart is a particular fossil from different species. So these are Australopithecines three million years ago. And I've marked on the chart where it's the size of a chimpanzee brain size. And these Australopithecines about three million years ago to two million years ago have pretty similar brain sizes to chimpanzees. Now, what that is, is these, these hominins, these early, early um, ancestors of humans, they, the mothers, they just didn't have any help from others. And because brains of an offspring to, to, for a mother to do all the breastfeeding, and to do all the nourishment to raise an offspring with a very large brain, and chimpanzees already have a very large brain, that, that takes a lot of energy. But if she's doing it all by herself, then there's a, there's a ceiling of how far she can do it. She, she can't raise a brain, uh, an offspring with a brain higher than about 600. So these were like, all these Australopithecines were like single mums doing everything by themselves. But what happened two million years ago, we just smashed through what's called that gray ceiling of brain size. We just went through two million years ago, twice the chimpanzee brain volume. This is Homo erectus, and it's uh, easily twice and more than uh, chimpanzee brain volume. And this is where cooperative childcare, collective childcare and grandmothering are really kicking in. So women are living with their mums and they have co uh, they have collectivity and solidarity already but we haven't quite explained what are the males actually doing in all this because presumably they're getting socialized into the system to some extent but have they really overthrown male dominance yet what happens at this later stage um, within the last million years is look at this, that the energy of available, this huge increase of brain size is just amazing for the ancestors of both us, modern humans and Neanderthals. This is just a phenomenal amount of brain increase, more than three times chimp. And before you get too um, kind of smug about it, we've actually decreased our brain sizes in the recent past within the time period of farming. But this is our hunter-gatherer ancestors and they just got bigger and bigger brains because they had splendid diets and they had plenty of sharing and that's how they did it. Um, but that means that these ancestors, particularly our foremothers, got males to do some work. Now, why is that, uh, why is that surprising? How do you get males to do some work? We're looking at chimpanzees there on the, on the left, the, who are very male dominant. And they are hunting monkeys and they literally tear these poor monkeys apart whilst the monkeys are alive and start eating them. Um, there is not much sharing going on at all in there, nothing. If a female gets a little bit of meat from the monkey because she would really could do with it she could do with the nourishment if she does she'll probably have to she'll probably have to have an estrus signal a sexual swelling and be ready to have sex and it has sometimes been talked about as 
prostitution theory, you know, so that's how females get meat. Okay, these are human hunter gatherers. They're quo hunter gatherers in the Kalahari, and they are coming miles and miles, 25 or more miles across the searing heat of the Kalahari Desert, bearing a huge antelope hemsbok all the way back to the camp, to the women and children, where the whole animal will be shared completely equally, um, waves of sharing to make sure everybody has got meat in their pot. Um, so these males have really gone to work for their children. And it is because of, partly because of that male work that uh, humans became such large brain species. Without this support to female childcare, there's no way that it could have happened. So how did our foremothers actually do it? You know, there's, there's a part of this which is evolution and there's a part of this which is revolution. So if we look at the evidence in women's bodies today, that is telling us about the background, the evolutionary background of gender, of sexual and gender relations in the past. Um, so, okay. How do we get males to work or do something useful? Well, we do it through sexual signals. Now we have a lack of obvious sexual signals. Women, all women everywhere, conceal ovulation. So it's very difficult for men to know when is a fertile moment. I mean, men may think they know, but they're not very good at it really. They don't know very well. And that's because women have evolved to hide it. Well, if you want, a man to hang around if a man is useful and everyone should have one you know he could do things like put up the shelves or go to the shops or do whatever it takes mend the car I don't know um if he can it sounds a bit sexist but why shouldn't men be doing useful things uh we, then you don't want to let him know what's the moment you're fertile because otherwise you know wham bam thank you ma'am and whoa he's off of course, that's not what men are like, but it is what great apes are like, what great ape males. Great ape males, the leisured sex, they want to find a fertile female, have sex, dealt with her, move on to the next one. That's the great ape male strategy, particularly dominant males. So concealing ovulation, but being able to have sex almost any time of the cycle, and we humans are the champions of that, bonobos are really sexy but we humans just we're the champions of like endurance or sex all the time around the cycle as long as we like or we can say no we're able to do that too we can make a maybe yes but no so we're able to do both what that does is it confuses for males males are not good at telling when are human women actually fertile they really aren't. Um, there's also this, this, um, this idea about menstrual synchrony, um, which could have been important also in the past. I'm not going to go into it too much, but if anyone wants to talk about it, we can. Um, synchrony as well makes it very difficult for a dominant male to, ha to, to manage more than one female at once. If all the females are kind of synchronizing their fertile periods and also their menstrual period. They, if they synchronize periods, they're kind of synchronizing fertility too. Uh, the dominant male doesn't know, shall I do with this one or that one? You know, which, which way do I go? Um, so that has, is a factor for making sure you know, everyone has one. Yeah. So it's equalizing. But there is this, question left because we do have a signal we have a significant signal in fact in our reproduction and in our reproductive cycle and it's menstruation and we're going to come to this in a moment the overall design of when i'm saying design it's like evolution of natural selection or sexual selection of women shown in our bodies today is we were designed to be nature's greatest time wasters um, for men, for males, 
for especially dominant males, they were not going to be, they, they would have to hang about. Oh, have I had sex with her? Has, has she got pregnant yet? How, can I, no, I've still got to stay here and make sure. It's in favor, it selects, in terms of evolution, it selects a male who's going to spend time with a female and invest in her, give, give you know, find food, help out, help with children. That, kind, that sort of male who's willing to invest, he's going to be the one that benefits out of this system. So this, this, uh, these features of our reproduction are selecting for investors and against dominant males who want to play the great ape game, okay? Um, so that's part of changing human males into, into men um, as against being great apes. But what about menstruation? And this is the big problem. Menstruation is the giveaway. And I'm just going to show you what is the revolution part. Menstruation is the giveaway because it lets a male who wants to be the dominant male, who wants to, let's put it colloquially in Trumpism, grab the pussy, that one, it, menstruation helps that one. So let's just see how this works. Um, you've got a, a group of females, so up in the top corner, a group of females, some of them are breastfeeding, some are pregnant, some may be after the menopause and not, or you know, so they are not menstruating. And there's one female who's menstruating. And she is the one that all the males are going to be interested in, especially a dominant male. Why? Because, okay, she's not fertile right then, but in a week or two, oh yes, she is. And the pregnant woman or the breastfeeding woman, they're not. This is with hunter-gatherers that they're not. And so, you know, th this, this female, the fact she's menstruating in this group means that's gonna cause conflict. These may be her relatives, her mom, her sisters, that's gonna cause conflict um, because potentially she'll take away investment by the males um, from them. And amongst the males, it's gonna cause conflict. Um, so we have a very ch we have a challenge to solidarity and cooperation here. So something needs to be done about it, and the uh, it's going to be have to be the females who do something about it. For a starter, this this young woman who's menstruating, she's one of their friends and relatives. They don't want to let her go, you know. So they're going to take care of they're going to take care of her, take charge of her. They're going to make sure that none of these males can just grab her, take her off on safari somewhere. And then they've got two choices. They could try to hide and pretend there's no menstruation so the males don't know. But actually that may be difficult and there is a better solution, the revolutionary solution. And the revolutionary solution is literally the picket line. It is you share the blood, you share menstruation, you use cosmetics, you use whatever you have to hand, if it means blood cut, blood for the starter, but you create a line, a picket line in solidarity, which is just saying, no, you're not gonna pick and choose between us. Literally, women's first word, spoken in blood, no. And this is what it looks like within human culture today. These are women of the Himba in Namibia, whose traditional form of dress uses red ochre cosmetics with, with fat of this beautiful gleaming. Um, and these are women who are in, immensely proud of this form of dress because they retain it even into this, this day. Um, and you can see that this is a, a kind of a, a, a moral solidarity of these women in a ritual performance. This is a ceremony for a girl prior to marriage, where she, where, you know, where is, which one of these women are the ones that is the target? You can't say there's a target. These women are instantly demanding respect, demonstrating solidarity. And as a result of that, the men who are, you know, seeing that will be creating their own solidarity. Um, here we have 
oh, I did, sh I was going to show another picture of the himba with the, the pigment that they used um, and which they still use in terms of red ochre, the iron oxides, red ochres, but there are also plant pigments that can be used. And these pigments reach back in the archeology span of human origins over um, 200,000, 300,000 years, possibly even half a million, possibly even before we became modern humans, but, they became, but the revolution is marked in the archeology span of modern humans, 200 to 150,000 years ago suddenly red ochre becomes a, a huge explosion it just explodes now the reasons for that is one the women who are saying no who are they saying no to they're saying no to a dominant male who is not willing to go hunting and work for for his female for his partner um, and in doing that, in fact, the males who are willing, who do want to look after their children, they are going to be on the side of the women because this system creates a kind of sexual, so it, it selects out the dominant male and, it, and men are going to be very, you know, very pleased to be part of the system with these ritually decorating cosmetic co coalitions of women. Um, so it's a kind of a, a, a creation of, of um, it's a creation of taboos. Um, it's a creation of the sacredness of the body. It's a creation of the whole symbolic domain. In fact, the first word of language being spoken as a no by, by women's dancing bodies. And these are examples of um, right down into the present day uh, from the Kalahari uh, Khoisan hunter-gatherers, menstruation, first menstruation rituals, where women um, dance what is famous, what is perhaps one of the oldest rituals on earth, the ritual called the Eland bull dance, the first menstruation dance. And the women are, uh, they're making a great game. It's, it's uh, uh, fun and games out of, um, the fact that they're saying no to men, no to the hunters, they have these horns pretending as if they're elands. Elands are giant antelopes, which are very fat and very delicious. Their horns, they're poking away the hunters, keep away, the girl is in the menstrual hut and the girl herself is, it, she, is create, she is changing and changing. She transforms with enormous power into the Eland bull, while these women are dancing around, mating, they're pretending to be Elands mating with the Eland bull. This is as the best way that women can say, no, we're not having sex with you guys right now because we're busy. We're busy with our great Eland bull. So you just, you just go away. And, and what, they're, what they're telling to, what they're telling to the hunters, is you go away and hunt those eland and when the blood of you know our blood is like the game animal blood we we're we're creating a sort of equivalence between women and the game animal when you've hunted that game animal bring it back and then we we'll, then we'll see when we've when we've cooked that meat when we've shared that meat okay then we'll see maybe you deserve some some something then so this is the sex strike idea um, no is the first word. You know, the, uh, the whole of symbolic culture comes out of this collective action on the picket line. Women's solidarity, defending the, any possibility of one male grabbing and, and sexually coercing, just completely, just completely prevents that. Hunters take. Uh, hunters are going to respect this female solidarity by creating their own solidarity in cooperating in the hunt. And that really is the story, the revolutionary story of the emergence of human cultural solidarity. Um, I've got one last little picture there for the Bayaka, the Ngoku, um, but I'm going to come out of that. These are Central Africa. The reason I've got this picture is again to stress, you know, the, the 
it's very difficult. I'm, I'm talking about African hunter gatherers. And the reason I'm talking about them is these people live with non patriarchy. Well, I'm going to ask Chris a minute in a minute to talk about what do we call that actually? What is non patriarchy? And this is so difficult for us in our culture to think about because we hardly have experienced what that really is like. Now, some of you may have had glimmers of experience of it, um, but we are, we, and even if it, it appears sometimes, it's within the institutions of capitalism and patriarchy in our lives. But these hunter gatherers, these are Central African forest hunter gatherers by Aka people. And the, the picture is of women in their ritual called Ngoku. We actually have a little bit of film to show you on that. And they sweep, they're like a militant, an uh, armed, an army of dancing women sweeping into the camp. And these photos have been taken at a long distance because Jerome Lewis, who studied with, has lived with the Bayaka a long time, kind of has to be at a distance. All the direction of gaze, men are turning their gaze away. Um, women have swept into the camp. They're chanting these incredible rude slogans about, oh, old men are useless. Their balls are broken. Penises are useless. They just produce wee wee. Only women's genitals are strong. You know, we have the power. And it's almost incredible. It's just so difficult for us to imagine that in the work, in the kind of patriarchy that we that we've lived in. Um, so, Chris, is it true? Can it be true that women ever ruled the world? And what would we call that? You're muted. You're mute. You're mute. Oh, okay. There's no <laughs> doubt that, that there have been matriarchal societies, societies with matrilocal residents and matrilineal descent. Obviously, the English is Iroquois was an example, but there are plenty of others. But of course, women ruling the world would be a different thing. And I suppose I should say, <laughs> just to start with, um, no, women never rule the world. Um, but on the other hand, um, they did something in some ways more amazing and, and magical. So I, 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 let me just say, I, for me, the best term for what Camilla has been talking about, the best term for what happens among gender egalitarian African hunter-gatherers is communism in motion. That's Mona Finnegan's expression. She did, she did field work among the, the Bayaka people uh, under, under Jerome Lewis. Um, what exactly does communism in motion mean? Well, everything living um, has some kind of pulse, some kind of periodicity. And what, mean that, what, what Mona uh, means, she says communism in living, she's using that expression from, from Lewis Henry Morgan and, and of course Engels, communism in living is communism in motion. And what this means is that women, women take the power through a ritual like Nagoku, where the women just bond together, um, storm into the camp, celebrate their, their, their potency. Um, but after a while, it gets a bit boring. I mean, having, having really made their point for a few days and having kind of, it's, it's very playfully, of course, terrorized the men, um, they, they, you know, okay, well, we're gonna give this up now. And, and so life returns to normal for a few days. And then what happens is that the men kind of answer back. So I, now this is just relating to a particular group, the, 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 the Benjeli or Bayaka that Mona was working with and that Jerome was working with. But what happens in this group is that after a while, the men have their answer and it's called Ejengi. So this is a, this is a, a, a male counterpart to Ngoku. So it's, it's like a, it's like almost like patriarchy, actually. The men do nagoku and they stomp around, they show their muscle, they show what they're, they're real men. And of course, the, the women the women like this. They kind of, you know, really proper men, these, and, and the women like men who can hunt and are very brave and so on. And, and what Mona described is really interesting. She says that actually, the women are kind of wanting the men to, to sort of prove their, I won't use the word masculinity because that concept isn't really there, but certainly prove their muscle power and their strength as hunters. And it could get worrying if the if the if the if the men's um, ejengi, the, their ritual, were to 
if they're able to outlast their welcome, if they're to stomp around a little bit too long, it could get scary. But what the, what the reason the women actually appreciate the Jengi, this, this display of male collective power, is because it, it's kind of threat which the women need that threat because then having a sort of a sort of vision of the possibility of the males going too far with their with their with their jengi, it it, prov it provokes the women to respond with their with their with their uh, ngoku, and so you have a, a, a pendulum of power, and that's what Mona means by communism in motion. You have a, a, the women show that they can rule, in a way rule the world, but then the critical thing is to have something. And I try to think of words for the, to tie in more closely with uh, with, the, with the Marxist tradition. It's uh, one of them is dual power, actually. Mm -hmm. So dual power is when, uh, as everyone I think knows, probably here, um, after the after the Tsar was overthrown um, in February uh, 1917, there was a period of dual power. So, but because the because the, the still remained a threat of the restoration of the Tsar, the restoration of the, of the, of the autocracy, the, 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 the proletariat, the revolutionary class was kind of feeling under threat, but also feeling that they could counter that threat through the Soviets. But of course, what happened, of course, is that, you know, um, the, the revolution occurred and then things went wrong. I won't go into all that. Thing. But how do, the question is, how do you make a revolution permanent? You've got to know how to develop a pulse. You can't, what, if you just have a revolution, and, and set back, okay, we've had our revolution now, everything's sorted out, let's sit back. That is not what the way hunter-gatherers perceive their egalitarianism. You don't sit back because you've got primitive communism. <laughs> There's always a threat that somehow you lose your gains. And so what the, what the, 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 the Benjeli do, the women actively take power, surrender that power, actively encourage the men to take power so that the, the threat of, of a permanent patriarchy is, 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 is responded to by a new wave of matriarchy. Now we think, all of us think in, in the radical anthropology group, and there's just so much evidence from all the ways the rituals are, are organized, that actually that wasn't, a, wasn't an annual rhythm. It wasn't that you take power in the summer and you lose it in the winter. Much, much, much more likely, because so many of the rituals just sh show this, is that it's lunar, with women taking power around the dark moon and surrendering power for the for a kind of honeymoon around full moon, and you get this, this pendulum of power and perhaps I'll just, um, if I could, if I've got time, I can just read out. This is from this is from Mona, a little description uh, of an from an article that she published in the Journal of the Royal Anthropological Institute, the politics of eros, ritual dialogue, and and she's describing right across Africa, wherever you have gender egalitarian societies, not just the, the society she was uh, witnessing, but the, 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 here this little quote I'll read out, take about a, a minute or so, mm. is from the from Ben Delhi. At Mbule one evening, I watched two lions dancing at each other during Elande, the courtship dance. The women stamped and clapped, pouring out a high polyphonic alto. The men a few yards away growled their way through a deeper bass polyphony. Then a girl shot out across the space and struck a boy before flinging herself back to the women, her victim in pursuit. You have to remember, this is a game, this is playful. All these rituals are occasion for an enormous amount of eroticism and, 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 and laughter. When he reached the women, he struck another girl and she immediately broke lines and flew back after him, choosing a different man. And so on, back and forth, back and forth, the antiphony growing stronger as the motion became more fluent, the separate song lines held by the core dancers, muscles and tendons shining in the firelight. Finally, the laughter reached a climax and the women cackling crumpled into the dust before a second, more ponderous stage began. There was something fierce behind this game. This was politics as a live force, the tension of sex being given form and voice and space, the movement, the continual back and forth as power swung between the two lines seemed integral. It was both a literal and metaphorical dance, a politics rooted in motion. So if I'm asked, did you ever have, did women ever rule the world? I'd say they were very clever in the way they rule the world. They knew that it's very important to know how to take power, but once you've really taken the power, it's just as important to know how to surrender it so that you can take power again. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, do we have to, we have this little film, I don't know, is it a good idea? Let's show it. Because... Yeah. 
you know, it's seeing non-patriarchy in action and it, and it fits to Mona's description. Um, if I share screen again, um, and then we can finish. Uh, woo, have I got it? Where's my share screen? And I hope I can play this. Okay, and I've got it. stop stop there on on that statement that we're going back to the beginning of the world is 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 the idea of it um and we're seeing that toing and froing of the ngoku it in fact this was a film by bruce perry and he actually cut out some of the most raunchy parts of it you're seeing an edited censored version there um with the uh, sugarcane um, dildo uh, action but um so uh yeah we we did win the revolution before we we found the recipe for obtaining a balance a movement of balance between the sexes that created you can see there the women's solidarity create the men's solidarity um and that was our human birthright that that was what made us human and we can think that well African hunter gatherers, what have they got to do with us today? But I'm sorry, we have been as human species, hunter gatherers far, far longer. It's what we evolved, it's what made our bodies, our minds, our hearts, our souls. Um, so that is what we are. I mean, that that is what being human is to a large degree. So um, yeah, we won it once, we can do it again. 
Absolutely fascinating. I promised, comrades, and I'm sure people who've not heard about this theory before, I'm sure there will be like 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 I when I when I first heard it, and then I heard it a second time, and a third time, and a fourth time, and every time I learned something new. And it, it is a fascinating subject. Thank you very much for explaining it. Also, I think the the pendulum of power is a really interesting concept you do think you do kind of think oh well you know if there's once there's equality or egalitarianism that's it you know once we have communism we're all going to be living happily ever after and it probably won't be like that at all as you say you know it's, it's a, a dialectical <laughs> thing isn't it so you have to keep it alive and change it etc i mean that is why um hunter gatherers have really the in terms of politics such a sophisticated um, system. They're, they're so kind of politically intelligent because they're always working to make sure that that illegalitarianism is maintained. They, they assert it, they have to keep working at it, um, and they use very sophisticated weaponry. They don't use weaponry of, you know, thuggery and, and violence. It's laughter, it's mimicry, it's joking, it's banter, it's making sure that people get, you know, pulled back to, to mm being human again. I was going to mention that. Uh, I think I've heard Chris say that before, um, explain that before, when when a male, you know, occasionally a strong young male will get, you know, the, the hormones kicking in and stuff. And then the women sort of band up against him and, you know, make fun of him and bring him right back down. Especially, it's especially the art of the grandmothers. Um, it's maybe the little old women who who sees somebody who's just stepping out of line and it's usually a man it's not always it can be not only women and kids too but it, but it's usually an obnoxious often young man and she just starts to mimic something that he's doing um just quietly and everybody starts to watch her because they know that she's <laughs> a past mistress and and people gather around and they start to express appreciation and then they start to join in the mimicry and the dance and he is the last one to know. And suddenly he realizes, oh my God, what's happened? It's all me, it's me that they're doing it for. So either he then storms off or he said, oh my God, what an idiot I am. Um, but either way, whatever he does, he's allowed to come back to be human again, mm -hmm. that he can realize what has happened and he's reintegrated. So nobody bears grudges. Everything's forgiven, forgotten. It, it moves on. There's no zero tolerance, is there? <laughs> yeah. Well, it, there's, there is zero tolerance, certainly, of, of, uh, but but there's zero tolerance. Never change, you know, that you want, you know, I'm Nail. trying to make an analogy, yeah. but it probably doesn't work. M Marxists aren't very yeah. used to dealing with this topic of laughter, but of course, Mikhail Bakhtin was the great, the great theoretician of carnival and, and laughter. Um, as, as, and of course, there's the, this idea of a periodic period when you just laugh at all the authorities, the Feast of Fools, the, the tradition of carnival is, is actually sort of vaguely still with us, of course. But laughter for hunter gatherers is the primary leveling mechanism. Yeah. And as Camilla was saying, the women is led by the el elderly women. The, they, they laugh and laugh and laugh, making fun of this kind of absurdity it's through mimicry, without words, actually. Uh, until finally this amazing thing happens. He joins in the laughter at his own expense. Mm. And that's the critical thing, is to be able to laugh at yourself. Okay. That proves that you could see yourself as others that see you. That's the critical psychological revolution that only humans have managed, to see ourselves as others see us. Mm. Interesting point. Now, I, I do want to touch quickly on... Um, what changed because we're not exactly living in that kind of society anymore we, we don't want to go into too much but the the neolithic counter-revolution is is quite uh, important in that isn't it when when things really turned for the worse and as Engels described that's when the the family was invented which you know marriage invented as a, as a way to shackle women and to pass on property uh, etc one of you two could say something about that for a few minutes let's just say first of all sex strike isn't a theory it's just what happens with hunters and gatherers the the, 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 the word usually used by anthropologists is not sex it's not sex strike it, they they use the word bride service mm. um but what what that means is that a, a young woman's 
as she comes of age, she, she goes through a ritual, an initiation ritual, bonding her to her mother and her sisters. She continues to live with mum and therefore with her own kin. And a young man who wants to, who fancies her, he has to visit her when she's with her, her, her mum. And he never, this is the critical thing about egalitarian hunter-gatherers, he never acquires conjugal rights. There's never a thing called a wedding. Ah, oh, you've married me, you said yes, therefore I've got sexual rights in you. That At no point does that happen. So what that means is that if he wants to continue with the relationship, he's going to make himself useful. He's going to be good-humoured, he's going to be generous, he's going to bounce a little kids on, on his knee, he's got to not worry too much whether those kids are fathered by him or somebody else, because the woman doesn't give a damn about all that. She wants all her kids to be looked after and cared for, no matter who the, the guy she's currently having a relationship with. And, and so sex strike, it, it's not a theory. It's, it's just that a, a man is out on his ear if he doesn't behave. And the reason he's out on his ear is because the woman's got all her kin around and she can just say, right, that's, that's it, no more sex. And that's quite a, that's quite a, that's quite a lot of leverage. But um, for that to work, you really needed to have uh, abundance. You needed to have a, a, an economy of actually not just abundance, actually super abundance. Now we've, we've all heard of the great mammoth hunters of the Ukraine and the mammoth, mammoth hunters of Siberia. All around the world, wherever Homo sapiens um, spread following the human revolution, the, what happened was that the, 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 in Australia, you had these gigantic animals called um, dipterodons. Di these are what are called megafauna. In North America, you had the giant camel. You had these incredible creatures. And, and it's, it was very unfortunate. But as humans were such uh, efficient hunters, they tended to, to focus on the very largest of these animals. And if you kill a female mammoth, that's quite a damage, you know, a lot of damage to the herd, as, as with diprotodons in Australia. And what happened was that these, these animals, um, as a combination of human predation, but also a combination of climatic features. But the, the, they, they, they survived these climatic changes, these large animals, for many times previously. But the tipping point came when, when humans arrived. And these animals had not had time to develop their defensive strategies, except in one place, Africa. So if you, if you want a sort of a vague picture of the extraordinary wo world of gigantic creatures that were all over the, in every continent, just think of a giraffe. What's left in Africa. Um, or, a, or an elephant. So in, until right up until very, very recently, the Hadza were hunting large animals like giraffe and zebra and the, and the Benjeli were hunting elephants. I mean, imagine a, 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 sm a smallish human being with a, with a spear hunting elephants, just, you know, the size of mammoths. Now, once those animals in most parts of the world became extinct, then when women did their their, their nagoku, their their, their, their their dance performance, saying you, you know no sex unless you come back with a with a very large animal, what happens if there isn't any large animal out there? So what happened was that with the, with the, with the extinction of the large animals, you had to then switch over to foraging on a much more daily daily day to day basis for much smaller animals. You can't do that once a month. The critical thing about the large animals, you, if you imagine mammoth hunters. You, you, uh, around full moon, you, you kill a mammoth. Well, that will keep you going for a good month. You can have, a, you can slow down the rhythm of hunting and play to a, a once a month ceremonial hunt, if you like. But once those large animals have gone, you've got to, that 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 clock, the moon, ceases to be relevant, and in fact, it gets in the way. And so, women, without a capacity to synchronize with the moon through their cycle, then somehow just can't can't maintain that way of life. And, and that's sort of the deepest reason for the collapse of that, that, that communism in motion. And, and places like Stonehenge, as Lionel Sims explained, I know, Tina, you've heard Lionel speak, places like Stonehenge mark the attempt on the part of people who until recently, fairly recently, had a, had a lunar calendar, had to switch over to a seasonal calendar, it was quite a difficult transition. And the massive um, monuments, megalithic monuments like Stonehenge were attempts to sort of manage that very, very risky and dangerous transition from one calendar, a monthly calendar of ritual, to a seasonal calendar, and actually um, long. even longer periodicities. But that is another question. So it's not, it isn't, it isn't simply that the idea of farming, although that was critical. It's the, it's the idea of no longer having superabundance and the ability to slow down the rhythm of hunting to a once a month ceremonial hunt. Yeah. So scarcity. The short version is scarcity. Scarcity keeps yes. leads to. Yeah. oppression and competition there, there are a few factors that that are vitally important for women to keep that non-patriarchy that we were looking at um 
Chris has met, the, the abundance, the aspect of abundance, it's a bit paradoxical because these hunter-gatherers who are so egalitarian with their big game hunting in Africa, they are often called um, immediate return, like they don't store or keep anything. So people then think, well, it's because there is surplus that some people can monopolize that and then create uh, stratification and eventually class. But the reason that these guys don't store anything is literally that they store it in their relationships. They don't need to store anything because they know there will be stuff tomorrow. Because even if they can't find something, somebody else will. It's because they have this absolute egalitarian sharing that they're able to do that. Um, and that rests on abundance. It isn't scarcity. It isn't because they have so little. It's because they can manage to share um, what they're, everything, all that there is. Um, other important factor for women is the mobility, the fact that they can always decide to just go or get or just get the man out um, if, if necessary. They can just go back to their mom or they can go to, to any friend or relative. Um, and the solidarity of the women that they're all able to, to work together. Um, they defend each other when, you know, sometimes hunter gatherer men also do behave badly, but women will leap to each other's defense um, to, to prevent any violent escalation. Um, so these are all very significant factors um, in maintaining women's status. Um, mm -hmm. and, with, and when hunter gatherer women get forced into a situation of settlement, those those factors become harder to operate the the leverage is harder um the more settlement the more that women are stuck in one place the less they can get the, the support of their kin um the more they're kind of fixed into a particular marriage very much as Engels told with with lewis henry morgan's story that is also true um, but there are several pathways to patriarchy and there are aspects of patriarchy, even in some hunting cultures, because they don't have the large game animals anymore. Um, so we cannot be too simplistic about saying it's it's just farming. And uh, this uh, recent work of um, uh, David Graeber and Wengro has highlighted that there are some early city or early urban complexes where there may have been significant aspects of egalitarianism still persisting um, with women's or with, with fundamentally women organized um, uh, 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 societies to, to some degree. Um, but I think large game, uh, large game, large not game, large livestock, large domestic livestock, which was identified by Engels as very significant step to the women's historic defeat, the de historic defeat of, of women um, was, that is important. And it was very important, especially in Eurasia, where there is just an order of magnitude, more inequality created in Eurasia, the old world compared to the new world where they did not have such large livestock and where they maintained very strongly gender egalitarian societies, even with horticulture in many, in many areas of, of North America, um, as South America. Mm -hmm. So um, those, are, those are significant, definitely significant features. I think the, um, the question of abundance is quite important, as you say, also, I think when we're trying to imagine a world which is different to today when we're trying to think of what what would a, you know a real living yeah. communism yeah, situation be like and then theoretically I mean you look around the world and you think it's the poverty is terrific and it is but it doesn't have to be like that is it? we have the yeah. theoretical possibilities and practical possibilities to stop poverty and create conditions for a, a egalitarian society isn't it, it the, those hunter gatherers in those hunter-gatherer camps, nobody could even conceive that there would be some children going to bed with their bellies full, no, you know, eating all they could, and some people, children going to bed with no food. And it, you know, we have a society today where that is happening for millions of children in this country, one of the richest countries in the world. And just which, is, you know, what is civilization here? Where, 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 which is the culture that requires development and education here, it, it would be inconceivable 
for hunter gatherers. Just inconceivable. Okay, we've got uh, Tony's got a question or a comment. Um, hello. Hello, Tony. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's all very interesting and fascinating, and I must confess, apart from reading Engel's book many years ago, uh, it's all a bit new to me. Uh, I have to say that it was with some trepidation that I even entered this. I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> when, when you started talking about overthrow of patriarchy, I wondered what might happen next. Uh, <laughs> But if I can make a few points, uh, que really queries as much as statements. Uh, you talk about power of men or women in these societies, but in essence, power derives from property and class relations. So it wasn't really power. It was, if you like, fluctuating relationships uh, between the that sexes. Was power. It was power. Chris, Chris, let him ask the question first. <laughs> well, that's how it seems to me anyway. But I think one of the conclusions we can draw is that when people are born into a society, they take that society as natural and as given and as having always existed from time immemorial. So people today cannot envisage or imagine what things may have been like in the past. And therefore, there is a tendency to write back into the past from the present. In other words, to actually superimpose upon the past your vision or view of how you see those societies. And that's why people find it so very difficult, uh, of course, to imagine and to understand. But I, I assume, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that these primitive communist societies, I mean, what, what if you like, took place was a development of class society uh and that was the basis of uh if you like what you call uh patriarchy you, you, i think chris is nodding so uh i'll be interesting to, exactly wrong to doing the opposite of nodding <laughs> no i mean i, I meant nodding. Yeah. <laughs> he wasn't like nodding in agreement but in disagreement yeah. as it were uh but if you tell me i'm wrong fine i'm uh, Always. Just one final question. I remember years ago, Chris, I was in a meeting, a briefing when it was, uh, I can't remember her name, but a, a woman anthropologist arguing that there was no such thing as matriarchy or matrilineal, matrilineal societies. And I, I just wondered if you had a comment on that. Well, I mean, two, two things. First of all, um, you get patriarchy long before you get class. So I mean, right across Aboriginal Australia, nearly the whole of Australia, and it wasn't just caused by white people arriving across most of Australia. You've got the Western Desert and places, you've got very extreme forms of, of male dominance, kind of a, almost like a kind of male terrorism against females. Uh, and, and, and to call that class society would be I, I don't think you would want to call it class society, Tony. So patriarchy is much older than class society. Um, as for the idea that matrilineal doesn't exist, I just I don't know who on earth this person was, but it's, it's, I don't know. It's just a very peculiar idea. I mean, the, cri the critical thing is that we now we, we've now got what's called paleogenetics. We can actually use genetics to work out what's been going on in the past. And so, as far as residence is concerned, which is, means where a woman lives after marriage, after have, forming a relationship, I shouldn't you really use the word marriage, but with hunter gatherers, where a woman lives, where, where she lives with her mum, she has her mum as a support when she's giving birth and advice over breastfeeding and all those things. And it just so happens that in Africa, the hunter gatherers are mostly, um, almost all of them, they practice what's called matrilocal residence. And that, that biases kinship uh, to, towards a, a matrilineal extreme. Now, <laughs> it's just that, a few years ago at a conference in Liverpool, Camilla and I were there, I think it was 2012 or 2014 in Liverpool, we were waiting for these geneticists to come up with their findings about, about whether uh, in Africa, hunter-gatherers had traditionally been uh, living with mum, living with mum, living with mum down the, down the generations. And it, and it just so happened, I mean, we were, we were kind of holding our breath because of course, if they come up with the opposite conclusion that the genetics showed actually patrilocal residence was the norm for hunter-gatherers, we'd have had to admit, okay, we, you know, we got it wrong. That my whole theory is wrong. Everything we said in the radical anthropology group is wrong. Okay, anyway, the answer came out. 
um, from, from the geneticists, a whole raft of scientific articles in this, even more these days. Women in Africa, if they're hunter-gatherers, have been living with them, living with them, living with them, on down the generations, with the farming people, women have had to move out on marriage and live with their husband's relatives. So we've had genetic proof, scientific proof, for the theory which I advanced in, in my book, Blood Relations, about the, pri the primacy of matrilocal residence and therefore uh, of matrilineal kinship. Okay, Carol, please. Hi, uh, that's been absolutely fascinating. Uh, um, wonderful to hear all this. I've, I've read Engel's book. I've, I found lots of it quite difficult, but this has been wonderful. The, the, but you're called the radical anthropologists. Now that seems to indicate that the mainstream is, is very much against you. Is that correct? Um well, uh, Chris has been battling this battle longer than I have, but maybe I'll just say um, that the idea of radical is really trying to bring together uh, social and cultural aspects of anthropology with biological and evolutionary and try and bring them, you know, actually make them talk to each other. And the extraordinary thing about anthropology in academia in this country today is that there's like evolutionary anthropologists over there and the social people over there and they won't talk they just talk a different language and they talk past each other it, it's ridiculous so in some ways we are in between we're in a kind of limbo where the evolutionary people are very suspicious of all our marxism and red you know red ochre and all that and solidarity you know that this is difficult for darwinists to understand yeah. um while the social anthropologists think oh you're with those evolutionary psychologists and biologists and <laughs> and this is horrible sexist stuff so we kind of get it in the neck from all sides um all right but now chris has got something to say well it's just that in in many ways we are now the mainstream i mean as far as the genetics of matter local residents is concerned as as far as the the consensus among pretty much all hunter-gatherer researchers that the immediate return in other words non-storage hunter-gatherers are egalitarian but mainstream but much more exciting is is what camilla was mentioning with sarah hurdy there is a pretty much a consensus now that the reason we've got these large brains <laughs> is because of collective childcare single mums without a welfare state which you didn't have all those <laughs> many years ago single mums would have needed babies who they could get up and running much more quickly um, and a large brain baby is very very you know demanding heavy dependent on lots and lots of care and, and without getting support in childcare, you wouldn't be able to afford those large brains but what I, but what i wanted to say was that to, to answer your question i've just got another quote here it's now become the kind of the consensus, really, among everybody that knows anything about it, and that, and, and you know, that that means almost all archaeologists these days and, and, and evolutionary biologists that, that collective childcare did it. And yet, yeah. I'll just read this out. This is this is the, the founding, almost the founding statement of social anthropology. The person who founded official academic anthropology in many ways, certainly in the, in the English-speaking world, or at least in, in England, was somebody called Bronislaw Malinowski. He's just the most famous of all the anthropologists. And, and this is his statement on this topic of collective childcare. Oh, yeah. And it set the scene for the whole 20th century. A whole school of anthropologists from Beethoven and on have maintained that the maternal clan was the primitive domestic institution. In my opinion, as you know, this is entirely incorrect. <laughs> but an idea like that, once it is taken seriously and applied <laughs> to modern conditions, becomes positively dangerous. I believe that the most disruptive element in the modern revolutionary tendencies is the idea that parenthood can be made collective if once we came to the point of doing away with the individual family as a pivotal element of our society, we should be faced with a social catastrophe compared with which the political upheaval of the French Revolution and the economic changes of Bolshevism are insignificant. <laughs> the question, therefore, as to whether group motherhood is an institution which ever existed, whether it is an arrangement which is compatible with human nature and social order, is of considerable practical interest. So yeah. it became absolutely taboo to mention collective childcare until yeah. suddenly <laughs> everyone has to agree yes, it was collective childcare. We made it human. Anthropologists, <laughs> yeah. So when you say, are we mainstream? In many ways we are. We're saying, we're, we're, we're giving, we're, for example, our Darwinism is the mainstream version of Darwinism. 
which is called selfish gene dominance. We're completely mainstream about that. I mean, you know, and, and all the other things about the ochre. We, uh, in, in RAG, we have the world's number one specialist in the ochre record of human evolution. Right. So we're kind I didn't of, show the ochre. We should have shown some, but yeah. so we're, we're kind of mainstream, but somehow, you know, the message doesn't come across because it's the wrong message. So when it comes to all the sort of, you know, I don't know, magazines, Sunday Times and stuff, I mean, somehow, You'll, you'll get this, I don't know, a horrible book called Sapiens, which just is load, load of all gibberish and various other <laughs> nonsensical, nonsensical books which have got nothing to do with anything, but, but sort of yeah. you can buy them in airports and stuff. The, the, the effect of patriarch is to chop up the disciplines and yeah. try and sort of you, you kind of stay within your little cage and, and climb the ladder and compete and climb the ladder. You don't join them all up together with, mm. although that is what science should be about, yeah. that you're really being collaborative across disciplines. Mm. Um, and there is no theory more interdisciplinary than the one that we've been talking about today. Absolutely. They, they can't beat it. They can't beat it. They don't know how to falsify it. I mean, it, 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 I mean it, there must be a reason why you're not allowed to even know that anthropology exists if you're in, at school. Yeah, well, you know, it's not you're not allowed to know it exists until you've finally been conditioned to accept the norms of this society and then a, a certain kind of anthropology you'll be allowed to be in contact with but even then it's just one bit or the other it's either social or cultural or biological or whatever but they actually they actually have access to anthropology to study what it means to be human mm -hmm. it's still banned it's effectively banned really yeah. My, michael gove destroyed the well there was an a level for a short while and michael gove stomped on it Oh, my goodness. So it's, oh, sorry, sorry, Carol, I thought you were finished. <laughs> so sure. Go on, go on Carol. Thinking, it's, it's like the mainstream media clamps down on any socialist ideas or, or that, like they tried to stop schools, uh, even talking about Black Lives Matter or whatever. It's yeah. this stranglehold of the media on what gets out there. So more power, more power to you. And I hope we all, we all find out it's, it is actually mainstream and true. Well, that just, I just, sorry, just on that one thing. I mean, have you ever heard anyone come out with the actual, the, the, the kind of the take home message of anthropology is um, language is an African invention. Yeah. Culture is an African invention. Yeah. Religion is an African invention. Yeah. Kinship. It's an African invention. I mean, everything that makes us human was invented by Africans in Africa. Um, I mean, that's, you know, uh, and there's a huge opposition to that. Even, even that ridiculous book by Gabriel Wenger is, is can only grudgingly admit that actually, yes, everything began in Africa. They're still vaguely trying to say, no, it was, that, it was the upper Paleolithic. Look at the cave paintings in France. Uh, you know, all these things were a European invention. They're still trying to hang on to this nonsense, which is completely mm -hmm. racist. Um, so, but I mean, again, that is that should be the message which gets out. Yeah. But, yeah. Okay, thank you. We've got a couple more questions. I'm trying to hurry us along a little bit. I know this is fascinating, but uh, we can't be here all night, I'm afraid. Steve, hi. Uh, hi, uh, hi, hi, Camilla and, and, and Chris. Just to say that uh, I remember reading your book, Chris, I don't know if it was 10 years ago or possibly longer. I've lost kind of track of time now. I'm being inspired by it. 50 years and, ago. Yeah, well, whatever. A long time ago, anyway, I'm being inspired. And in fact, I went to um, a radical anthropology group series and so on. And I've always kept an interest since that point, but I haven't obviously followed it um, as closely as I, as I did back then. And the question I wanted to ask you is, in some ways, you partly answered it. So it's a bit of a big question, but thinking what I knew back then uh, and listening to you now, Obviously, things have moved on. It's the same story that I, we had back then, but at the same time, I can tell things have, have changed, but the fundamentals haven't changed. So that's how I feel about what you've just told me. And so I was going to ask you, what do you think is the most important things that have happened recently, which keep the story that you told originally going, and yet it's changed it. So I don't remember. So let me just throw in a couple of clues to that. One is One of the things I remember was, 40,000 years ago seemed to be, now that, that, that date seems to change, but I, I remember a lot of discussion about European cave paintings and the idea of symbolic culture and all those things coming out of Africa. I remember those sorts of things. 
The Neanderthals didn't figure much in the story, but that's also changed. So I just, my question is just what, what do you think? And I don't, the, the grandmother question that you, you, you brought in now, that seems to be something newer, which again, doesn't overthrow your theory. It just, it just makes it uh, better, if you like, or stronger, I think, or whatever. I mean, but so it's a bit of an open question, but that's what I wanted to ask you. What, what did you think? So I'd, in a way you've partly answered it. I mean, so, but you know, that's where I was. Just to say, I, I got one thing catastrophically wrong um, because I followed all the archaeologists, and that's the thing about the Upper Paleolithic Revolution. And already, when I was writing my book, my 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 friend Ian Watts um, was telling me, "Chris, Chris, Chris, this is don't <laughs> it's a hostage of fortune. Don't write that date because it's he he already knew that the revolution began in Africa, and I was still under the under the influence of these wretched um, archaeologists who thought it all happened in Europe. So that, I got that massively wrong. But the most important things are, I would say three, the paleogenetics, the, 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 the Sarah Hurdy stuff, yeah. um, and, the, and the kind of full appreciation of the bonobos. Those three things, yes. are, are the things which weren't there when you were around, Steve. Yes. And Camilla. Uh, yeah, but also, Steve is absolutely right about the Neanderthals. Mm. Um, we actually can use our model to make predictions about difference of strategies between Neanderthals and moderns, which would be a complicated, there, there are probably videos online where I'm talking about that. Yes. Um, it'd be a complicated uh, story that I can't really go into now. But, but I, I would be for one convinced that Neanderthals had symbolic revolution too. Mm. Um, but it didn't quite, take off with the explosions of the moderns. Somehow it was more in and out. It happened and then maybe died off and it happened and died off. And it could even just be to do with Neanderthal's smaller populations. Mm. Um, but I would, but you know, we're having babies with Neanderthals. We, we yeah, now yeah. know that for That's sure. Yeah. Um, so they really are another hunting and gathering population. They're not like, diff they're not so different yes. from us in a lot of yes. ways. But there are significant differences of organisation. <clears throat> Can I come in? Um, you're talking about hunter gather. Sorry, gather Charlotte, Charlotte, just a second. But you finished, Steve. Well, I was only going to say, I'm just going to comment on that just by saying, yes, I can, I can see all those things. And I remember listening to some of that things about Neanderthals and it's like, you know, it seemed, the story seemed to change. But just to say this, you've got the same story, but it's a better story, I think, and it's a stronger story since then. But I mean, it shows you're on the right track, even as Chris says, you possibly on the right. That is about science, isn't it? You're getting it largely right, but something has gone wrong, but then you come around. As long as you're scientific, you can, you can get, okay, if the theory is working, it will still work in a way, in a different way. You know, that's what I want to say. What uh, I would say another aspect that's added to is the amount of evidence from African hunter-gatherers with our colleague, Jerome Lewis, as well as Morna Finnegan's work with Central Africa, so that we've got much more kind of perspective from South Africa, East Africa, and Central Africa of the of of the centrality of of like menstruation in the cosmology, or what's called an ideology of blood with um, menstruation and hunting blood together. I mean that that's part of the story as well. That um, so. So it is, I, I'd, I'd say, yes, I, I think you're right. Okay, Charlotte, please. Yes, I wanted to bring in the, with this idea of the hunter-gatherer society and, and a matrilineal way of dealing with things. Um, I feel that the same sort of thing as has until recently happened in England, in such as mining communities, where people are all thrown together, they're all in long terraced rows, where the daughters go next door but one because that one's empty now, where the mothers and daughters and others in the neighbourhood are all in and out of the houses all the time, where the women support each other, and particularly, it's true, of the miners' strike. Yeah. It was the women who got up, worked together, stood at the doorway of every supermarket with a big bag waiting for thing, things to be put in so that they didn't starve to death. They got the soup kitchens going. They are the ones who always ran the families, in spite of the fact that the man was often a, what I would always term a brussel bugger, who often kicked him on the shins with his hobnail boots uh, if they didn't behave. There was still the thing that the women ran the family ran the community, and certainly in the miners' strike, that was so obvious. Uh, 
Yeah. And it's a pity from that point of view that mining stopped because it broke the communities completely. Now, where those women are now, where their daughters are now, I don't know. But, but you don't have a community if you don't have this strong need for it. And I think that definitely is a follow through. Yes. And probably the mill towns as well. I don't know so much about the mill yeah. towns, though. Sure. I'm sure you're absolutely right. It, ju it just shows the, the possibility of continuity in certain conditions. Um, and, you know, the future that we're facing, unless that kind of central organization with a matrix, as what you describe it as, of this sharing, um, caring of, of fundamentally women with, with the sharing of the, of the needs of children, um, prioritizing. This doesn't mean men are not involved. They're absolutely centrally involved, but it's on a basis of that solidarity and, and that interdependence. It, it's, it, that mm -hmm. is what we need in the future that we're facing. Yes, so yes. And of course, the other, the other aspect to that was the fact that was, it was very strong where I lived in South Yorkshire. It was the wife's place is in the house. Don't mm -hmm. tell me you're off out to work. <laughs> and that meant that their whole life then was tied up in that. There was no nine to five anywhere else. They might, do, yeah. might take in washing, but there was no nine to five elsewhere, yeah. which is why the community was so strong, yes. because they had to do something. This is what they did. And they did each other's washing and mending and, and, and clothes making and, and baking if they were ill and baby rearing and, and handed the kids round. It was sure. the same thing as you were describing. It is, yes. Um, yeah, Chris, want to say just, just, just as this, this, what you just mentioned, their woman's places in the home. Mm. <laughs> when you go to a hunter-gatherer camp, that, <laughs> that, that, that just gets, it turns itself upside down because actually, um, if you want power and connectedness and political influence, you better be at home because that's mm. where all the linkages are, all the stories are told, happens. all the relationships yeah. out in the out in the forest, out in the you and might be able to talk to a few trees. Or you, you, or, you see know. the the layout of the camp. It's the women at the center. I mean, you just see it physically. They're all there together, talking, laughing, singing in the center. Same thing. Uh, the men are out the edges, they're doing uh, smoking a bit of weed, they're doing a bit of gambling or whatever it is. And they're, but, uh, you know, they're waiting to be useful. But the women are doing it. The, the correct slogan is women's places on the picket line. And that needs to be a picket line which connects yeah. homes as well as places. Yeah. Of Okay. But we're missing a lot of that now because people are so separated out. So in their poverty, they're on their own. Yeah. In those days, they weren't. The, the cup of sugar went from house to house. I don't know how it carried on, but it did. And now it's lost. I know. Mm. Yeah. Okay, Diana, please. Thank yeah, you. I've just got a couple of comments to make. Um, uh, an extra one because of the discussion about the miners. During the miners' strike, I was um, living and working in London. So there was um, a whole group of um, Yorkshire women at uh, Holborn Station. I, I tended to go into work rather late, so I, they they were had buckets collecting money for the miners. So I was donating oh, to it. Yeah. They were chatting to me and complaining about the men going down the pub. Um, but I, I was also with the um, the uh, hunter gatherer community and the way they live. What um, is apparent to me, something I realised anyway is humans, neither men or women, are naturally monogamous. We naturally want multiple sexual partners, all of us. Mm. Um, and if, if you uh, say, say that to, to you know, too many people, it's not appreciated. Yeah. And it also strikes me that it's actually, I don't know whether it's just me, but I think I'm quite sure it's not. Um, I think it's a lot of people um, adapting to a sort of monogamous um, lifestyle isn't, isn't easy. And yeah. for some people, it's just downright impossible. Mm. Uh, I think you're completely right. The, the monogamy, um, which really is meant to apply to women, 
is a product of patriarchy. And that was the story that Engels and Lewis Henry Morgan told. The, oh, the, people, the, people, I, the people I showed, the Himba, um, who had this incredible, those gorgeous women with this ochre on them, and they're so proud. Um, there's just been published an extraordinary study just like this last week that is demonstrating that for married couples amongst the Himba, um, 70 percent, seven zero percent of those married couples have one child at least that is not by the husband because they have a, a standard practice of having informal partnerships outside the marriage. And there's and the men just get on with it. They just say, oh, OK, fine. Um, but they'll probably have a child with some woman somewhere else. And this is this is sexual strategies of non-patriarchy in action that create kind of bonds across the community in a, and, and prevent the atomization uh, um, of the, the we've been talking about in many ways and it, and it is all about a collectivization of of, ch of of children whose child you don't distinguish oh i'll look after that child but not that child and, and yet the, the dominant theory until about maybe 20 years ago was that um <laughs> every, everyone was saying they say oh we're darwinians you know so no man in the past would have ever gone hunting and brought back meat for his for his wife and kids mm -hmm. unless he was sure he was the father um, and um, of course, if you look at it from a sort of chimpanzee standpoint and only look at it from the point of view of the male, you could probably make a kind of case, given that, of course, fitness in Darwinian terms is, is, the, is, is the, you know, the, the ability to pass on your genes. So why would you, why would you pass on somebody else's genes? Um, much better to make sure that your, you know, it's your genes that are passed on through your, 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 your sexual partner. But of course, when you, as soon as you look at it from the woman's point of view, you just suddenly realize, well, of course, you know, you want your current partner to be nice to all your babies, no matter who the dad was. And also you want some freedom. I mean, you get you get fed up with like, well, you know, women are just likely to get fed up with their current partner as, as men might. And so any any genuine um, you know, gender egalitarianism, any any genuine women's liberation would clearly absolutely involve the right to have sex with who you choose. Clear, absolutely without any and in fact it's a critical point a critical point if, if women just somehow aren't allowed to have sex with who they please because their husband will get beat them up or something or murder them I mean, what you know i mean which is, of course is the situation under patriarchy it's, as we all know nearly all nearly all, nearly all, nearly all really that is the patriarchy of course i mean nearly all murders of, of, of men by of women by men are on those on those grounds of course but a woman needs her babies to be cared for by whoever she's with. And, he's, and, 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 and that's part of that thing that Camilla was talking about, where the, body, the human female body is actually to, sort of designed to minimize the, the ability of the male to, to kind of know no. that, yeah. that he is the dad or he isn't the dad. It's really important that, that those issues are, con are confused. A well, amount... it, it was quite interesting with the Himba that actually the men were quite good at telling but they still didn't let it bother them, which is, you know, that just shows. And there are also examples from many Amazon societies of what's known as partable paternity, where men just actually take a share. Um, so any man who's had sex with a woman, he's he's part of making that baby. Their, their idea is that it takes much more than one sex act uh, to, to make a baby. So, so, you know, several men can help and, and they do. And the ch and the children who have more than one daddy are better off. They have better survival. Interesting. Um, Felicity, I think you wanted to speak. But yeah. Oh, sorry. I'm. I don't know whether I've got a cold or an allergy. I'm, oh, right. I'm not. I'm not sure. So I'm really not in the right frame to <laughs> be on screen. But I just had a quick question. Um, do you see what links do you see? between these hunter-gatherer societies, or do you see any at all? And things like the early kibbutzim and things like that, do you see that there are any parallel, that there are any parallels or is any desire? That, but any, yeah, that's all I wanted, thank you. Chris, did you want? Well, critically important is to realize that hunter-gatherers are not and never were small scale societies. They actually lived on the largest scale that human beings have ever 
lived. So until until recently, in, in across across North America, South America, Australia, you had what in Australia are called maybe song lines, but you have these kinship systems, which mean that you can travel uh, uh, 500 miles, a thousand miles, and wherever you move, you're always at home because you you just need to t tell the people you you arrived at. You might speak a completely different language. They may say, well, you know, what's your totem? Oh, emu. Ah, oh, emu. Right. Okay. You've never seen these people before. Those are your wives. Those are mother-in-laws. Don't, you know, be careful about that. Lot respect there. These are your children. These kinship structures stretch right across the landscape, and and we we know that that we know partly from various, you know, archaeological things. Like for example, right across Paleolithic Europe, it's quite clear that it put the European Union into the shade. There was one system of kinship. And one system of symbolism with this very, very similar figurines, for example, right across the whole of Europe. And, and when, when people first started describing what was happening in Australia, you had these what are called section and subsection systems, sometimes sort of the shorthand is the idea of song lines. Wherever you went, I mean, obviously, average would have to be kind of careful and respectful because there was certain ritual ownership of, 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 of land, which, which means that certain you're, a particular group would be responsible for the fertility of the witchery grubs or the emus in each, so as to make uh, sort of gifts during ceremonies. So you had to be fairly careful, but but still, uh, kin your family, if you like, it's one way of putting it, it wasn't nuclear, it wasn't like an Englishman's, you know, home right, exactly. castle, exactly. right across the landscape. So where, where life is most meaningful, where you have your love, your sex, your children, that's actually a huge, massive network. And with, with, with us, it's been restricted to almost nothing. So right. would you include the Mayans and Aztecs, or okay. are they too near to nowadays, so to the, speak? The Aztecs were extremely um, uh, tyrannical, of course. And yes. So, I mean, there's no doubt that you get, you get these things called civilizations, which are extremely unpleasant in various parts of the world, which is another whole topic, which is interesting, but I'm not sure we can talk about it here. But okay. nothing well it's, there's some things to admire about the mayans i'm sure and even the aztecs i don't doubt but um but um basically not very pleasant uh, models to face the future they're, 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 they're warring their warf warring civilizations that um you know had had quite a significant amount of patriarch and imperialist violence um although you know they're, they're they're on different pathways from maybe the the old world um kind of um, warring civilizations but um there were groups that um reverted back to the when those civilizations collapsed reverted back to the forest into kind of hunting and gathering lifestyles again um which would have tended to recreate much more egalitarianism so um it just shows that people can you know there isn't only one direction of travel in in these changes um you want to say chris you want to say something about this well just say this terrible is, book <laughs> it's quite an interesting a book ter a terrible book in many ways but if you're interested in early civilizations and, and farming and stuff it is full of fascinating gems and insights mm -hmm. so the overall message of the book is pretty rotten but um and, and ignorant because it you know it's it yeah, it's, it's not very marxist it and, and it's very marxist but it's anarchist and yeah. theoretically kind of but i mean I, I would still recommend if you're interested in the subject yeah, it's interesting yeah yeah okay we're coming to an end now we've got two questions in the q a which i'm just going to read out quickly um christine asked quite a good one what happened to the old and disabled in those societies with no sex on offer from them uh, <laughs> Ian, oh, let me just look at the other one. Ian asks, uh, I was wondering about the seemingly dystopian condition of our common chimp cousins. Is it determined even now through cultural transmission and material condi conditions, or is it set in the genes? Have there been any experiments in how chimp societies develop in a more abundant setting? And this might sound like a crazy question, but is there any way a future socialist humanity could support a chimpanzee revolution against patriarchy? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Go on, Chris. I, I'll just go on the chimpanzee one, and you, Camilla, you can take the other question. The chimpanzee okay. one is very interesting because it is true that chimp. It's okay, so the, if you look at the map of Central Africa, the, the, the rainforest right across, you know, just above the equator, um, the, the, to the to the east, um, where Jane Goodall was, the, the pretty scrubby sort of living that the chimps have to make, and there's not much food, and the trees are rather short. You go further, further, further west to a place called the Thai Forest, and it's much more 
lush and abundant. And it is true that the, that the, the more rich in resources the, the, the environment that the chimps live in, the, the less the patriarchy, if you like, the less the severe male dominance. So in, in many, many, of the, many of the common chimps, let alone the bonobos, the females do form coalitions and there isn't much dominance and the, and the males don't you know, attack females and rape them and kill their babies very much. So there's, a, there's definitely a gradation. So, uh, and actually what's very good is that modern Darwinian is not modern Darwinism, which is now called, it's not called sociobiology anymore because everyone got into such trouble, you know, call it behavioral ecology or evolutionary psychology. Is modern Darwinism is actually Marxist. I mean, it, it, because I, I, I think just about every single person that studies chimps or any other creature understands that, you know, it isn't mind over matter. Chimps don't have this society or that society because they have an idea about it. It's, it's basically subsistence, scarcity, or, and, 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 and whether the food they need is, is in, in clumps or distributed quite widely, or it's up in the trees or down, or down the valley. I mean, all those materialist things, which, which, are, which exactly were the kind of things that Marx and Engels said determine human history, they, they also apply to other animals, including, of course, our primate close relatives, the great apes. <clears throat> Camilla, um, do you want to ask the uh, answer the question about disabled? Uh, and... Shall I try this? Um, I'll be, I'll can, you, sex. Can, can you hear me? No. Well, I'll, I'll talk about old age and disability a bit. Um, so I've described these hunter gatherer camps as like they they are like machines of collective childcare. They just they just work for that uh, for that purpose. Um, but then the question is about old age. But we have a lot of. Uh, prehistoric evidence for care of very old individuals, including with Neanderthals, Shanidar, for instance, um, individuals who've, who've apparently been disabled, but have been cared for in many ways by for long, long periods by their communities. And actually older people, I mean, we've just got to think about the grandmother hypothesis, which has created our lifespans with this long period after reproduction, um, of you know, hunter gatherer woman who's who's gone through her reproductive career after she's finished having babies, meeting menopause, has twenty odd years ahead of her is is quite standard um, life expectancy. Um, so this that that um, that quite clearly we were also you know, grandmothers and grandparents, both men and women, were very valued for their knowledge, very valued for their ability to advise and in, in cultural, pass down cultural knowledge. This would have been utterly central and critical for our ancestors. Um, it, it, that is part of making us the species we are. Um, in terms of disabilities, I mean, again, we've got prehistoric evidence of the care for people with, with traumatic injuries. Um, uh, our colleague Jerome Lewis has talked a lot about um, individuals that he's known who are seriously disabled from, for instance, if, if men do honey gathering up trees, they, there can be accidents, somebody breaks their back, they become totally disabled in those, in those circumstances with lack of, of, of uh, you know, modern medical care. Um, and yet those individuals are cared for, they survive. I, I can't I can't tell you about you know what how, how the sex life works, except that people who have disabilities have many avenues through which they they gain um, prestige and status. It, it, prestige and status isn't the right word because it's not about competition of status. It's they they have avenues for um, taking part in life. Um, so many famous Kalahari healers maybe blind, um, people who sing, people who tell stories are regarded as just as valuable in terms of their contributions to the culture. Of course they are. Um, and so those those people will also gain, you know, gain friends and followers and, and lovers, I'm sure. Um, there are aspects of old age that obviously do become problematic for hunter gatherers at a certain point where they lose mobility. But then that's true for our own societies and our own societies are probably less able to give the kind of support and loving care in many ways than, than uh, hunting and gathering societies. 
But one thing that really needs to be said, because the Guardian Feministas, the, the Caitlin Morans of this world, who haven't got all that good information, they often make an assumption that, oh, hunter-gatherers in the past, we used to die off by the time we were 50. This is absolutely wrong. Um, the, the lady I showed the photograph, Lumbi, uh, who was showing off her grandchildren, she was so, she was like, well in her 60s, she was so fit, she would run up trees to get the berries and the fruit and the, um, and you know, that people are so fit, fit in their old age um, because they're involved in this, in the community as grandparents being so, and, and so valued. And of course there comes a point where that they aren't going to be able to, to carry on that sort of very active lifestyle. Um, so that then that becomes a, a problem for for people in nomadic hunter gatherers and that and 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 that that is a, a hardship that is obviously a hardship. Yeah, there's usually a t sort of feeling if you really are immobile that you, I mean it's it's so difficult. But I mean I think with the hunter there's a place I remember being taken to with where where they they told us this is where people if they really want to die they, they go here. And, and with any luck, a lion, or, a and, lion uh, and, and, with any luck, a lion might come and eat you quite quickly. And um, they will be left in them. a place where they will have a little food or water, and 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 then it may, um, you know, they make the decision about that. And um, yeah. and of course, yeah, yeah. of course, the, the Inuit, sounds yeah. a better system than what we have today, and it's, stuck in in a hospital, etc. It's not obviously worse, no. <laughs> no. Thank you very much, comrades. That was really fascinating, as I knew it would be, because I heard it before. <laughs> but it was it was fantastic that you've explained it to us. I think it goes really well in our whole series of, uh, you know, it's called abolition, but what it's about is remaking society and thinking of uh, different ways of living with each other and thinking of uh, what communism could actually be like. And that's why I found this so, it's, it's so inspiring. We've had a revolution before before a conscious revolution led by women with men, though, as we've heard, um, we can have it again. And, you know, obviously yeah. we're living in different times, et cetera, but the issue of abundance has been sorted, really. It's just not distributed very well and not controlled very well. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, there, there is a possibility of a, of a very different society is within our grasp. And that's why I find this this whole idea very, very um, fascinating and inspiring. Um, Camilla will also be joining uh, me and Jackie Walker on next Monday at seven o'clock at Redline TV. It's a new Zoom show we've, we're launching with Labour Briefing. And that's that's looking at uh, International Women's Day um, in, a, in a more sort of uh, different background, in a different context. We're looking at different issues why aren't there so many women involved in politics. Um, the human revolution we'll be talking about again we'll be talking about uh, inspiring women of the russian revolution etc um, and i uh, hope many comrades join us men and women because it is an, an issue uh, for almost for more important for men than it is for women because we know what uh, women's oppression is like um, thank you very much for participating thank you very much for coming along and thank you very much for the thank audience thank you very and much Hopefully Tina, see you um, soon. Thank you for all the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good evening, Bye. comrades. Bye.